The Master Keys series of mechanical keyboards from Cooler Master features genuine Cherry MX switches and the flexibility of choice. Whether you want small, medium, or large, you can pick your size and pick your color with RGB and clear white LED backlighting options. Click the sponsor link in the description for more information. Excellent! What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today I'm doing a how to build a computer video to celebrate the launch of Ryzen 3. AMD has had a lot of success and actually the PC marketplace has been very exciting this year because of AMD's launch of Ryzen. They started with Ryzen 7, then Ryzen 5. Now we have Ryzen 3, which are quad core CPUs that don't have SMT or simultaneous multi-threading. So you do get four cores, you just don't get four cores and eight threads like you get with the Ryzen 5 series. So they seem to be very good price to performance options because the Ryzen 3 1300X only costs about $130 and then the Ryzen 3 1200 only costs $109. Both of them are quad core and both of them are unlocked for overclocking. Now my personal opinion, you should pretty much ignore the Ryzen 3 1300X, which ships at a frequency of 3.5 gigahertz base and 3.7 gigahertz turbo. The 1200 is clocked lower. It has a 3.1 gigahertz base and a 3.4 gigahertz turbo. But since both of these are unlocked for overclocking, just take that R3 1200 and set it the same frequency as the R3 1300X and then you have an R3 1300X for 20 bucks less. So I'm going to quickly go over choosing parts to build a budget uh, gaming computer because that's very important in making sure you choose the parts that are compatible as well as it will fit within budget. And then of course I will be diving into an actual tutorial going over step by step the process for building the system that I have laid out here today. One final note before I get into choosing the parts is that I actually built most of this system already in a live stream with a Ryzen 5 CPU just a couple months back, so I'll post the link to that video in the description if you want more of a full length walkthrough of the build process versus this video, which is hopefully going to be a little bit shorter than that one was. So to build a desktop gaming computer right now, you basically need seven components to put into the actual desktop computer, and those are right here on my right. The parts that you also need just to actually use that computer are here on my left, like a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse, uh, as well as probably an internet connection and that sort of thing. I'm not gonna be focusing on those today, so the price that I'm talking about is gonna be just for these core components for the build. Also, you might need a Windows 10 installation uh, key, and for that, you can check out my Windows 10 for $20. It's more like 30 bucks now, and I'll link that video in the description as well. Now, as far as the seven components for a desktop gaming computer, you're gonna need a processor, of course. You will need a motherboard, that's two. You will need system memory, that's three. You will need system storage, that is four. You will need a uh, power supply, that is five. You'll need a case, that's six. And then since we're talking about a gaming computer, you will need a graphics card as well, that is seven. And actually with the Ryzen series of CPUs, you need a graphics card in order to get video out because these CPUs don't have graphics built into them like the Intel CPUs do. Now I often see builds that are aimed at a specific price and I actually often do that myself since every month at the beginning of the month, I do a couple parts lists for people who are trying to choose the parts for their computer. Today I'm not necessarily focusing so much on the price, although from the title of the video you can probably tell this is about a $525 system that I I'm showing you guys how to put together, but I wanted to go about choosing everything a little bit more practically. So we already know that we're going to be using a Ryzen 3 CPU, and we'll say that we're going to be using the Ryzen 3 1200, which costs $110. So there's our baseline price, $110, bucks, and then we need to add on parts after that. Now, if you're getting a Ryzen 3, in my opinion, you should be able to overclock it. So you're gonna want a B350 chipset motherboard from AMD with the AM4 socket. I'm gonna be using the ASUS Prime B350M-A motherboard. It's a little bit smaller at micro ATX form factor versus the full size ATX form factor, but that will match up with my case, which is also micro, micro ATX. And you can get a solid B350 motherboard that supports overclocking on this platform for about 70 to 90 dollars and uh, this one actually costs about 85 bucks right now so there's that cost now memory is actually a bit challenging right now i'm going to be using this corsair vengeance lpx kit it's low profile which is nice and it's rated at 3000 megahertz transfer speed 
Having faster memory is a great way to get more performance out of your Ryzen processor, and I like 3000 as kind of, kind of a starting off point, although you can get away with slower memory as well. Now, since memory is so expensive right now, I basically am recommending an eight gig configuration. You can either get a single eight gigabyte stick or you can get two four gigabyte sticks, but either way, you're probably gonna end up paying about 80 bucks for that when you're talking about DDR4 memory and 3000 rated. And I definitely recommend checking your motherboard manufacturer's website first because they'll have a verified memory compatibility list you can look at that and see what the motherboard manufacturer has tested to verify will work with the motherboard and the BIOS version that's currently available for that. Next up is storage and there's two ways to go about having storage in a computer. You need storage because storage is long term, whereas the memory will get wiped whenever the system turns off, storage remembers information that is on it. This is a solid state drive and I highly recommend getting a solid state drive if you're building a computer right now, simply because they're very responsive and the speed with which this operating system loads when you're booting into Windows, the speed with which programs will load up, just the overall responsiveness of your system will be greatly improved by getting an SSD. Now you can get about 120 gig SSD for about $55 right now, but the best price per gigabyte you're gonna find is actually with the higher capacity uh, SSDs that are about 240 to 256 gigabytes. Those will cost you about $85 to $90 though, so for today, I'm, at least as far as the build list goes, sticking with a 120 gig version, although I am using this Kingston uh, HyperX as a stand-in. Honestly, most typical uh, SATA SSDs aren't gonna have a huge variance in performance, and they will all get you that speed and responsiveness that you want. I also recommend a hard drive to add into the system as well, and I usually say try to find an old hard drive that you can reformat and reuse. Otherwise, you probably need to spend about $40 to $50 on a one or two terabyte hard drive to get the system rounded out so you have storage to go along with your SSD. For a power supply, you can get away with a $40 to $50 80 plus bronze rated unit. Uh, I've chosen the EVGA 500BQ right here. Uh, you can get the EVGA 500B for about $45. Bucks. Again, it'll just get the job done. It's uh, not gonna look so pretty. The cabling might not be that nice. I have the BQ here that has all black cabling, but it does cost five or 10 bucks more. But with a 500 watt power supply, you can get the system up and running, and you'd also have a little bit of uh, wattage headroom. So if you decided to upgrade your graphics card in the future to something that uses more power, you'll be okay to do that. Case is next, and I have the Cougar Mini Tower here. This is a budget case, it's only 40 bucks, and actually it's harder to find now for some reason as, uh, as compared to a couple months ago. But a $40 budget case, again, will get the job done. I chose this one because it has a painted interior and it's micro ATX, but there's lots of options down in the 40, 50, 40 to $50 range. Uh, just look at reviews and find a case that uh, matches the uh, size of your motherboard as well as one that you like the look of uh, and, and reviews. Check those reviews because that's very important. This Cougar case is not all that great, but it's 40 bucks and it just provides some housing and some protection for the components that are going to go inside. Now with all those parts added to my shopping list, my current price for the desktop is about $415, but I don't have a graphics card yet, and the graphics card and the CPU are probably gonna be the most uh, expensive components for any desktop gaming system. Now for today, I'm gonna be using a GeForce GTX 1050 Ti. For about $110, you can either get a GeForce GTX 1050 Ti 2GB model, or you can get an AMD Radeon RX 560, which is also a 2GB model, and both of those are perfectly adequate for 1080 gaming. They're not super high-end or anything like that, but they will, again, get the job done so you can play some video games. Now, for about $140, you can get the 1050 Ti 4GB, or you can get the RX 560 4GB. Those will give you a bit more performance, still good for 1080 gameplay, but then beyond that, you're gonna have a hard time finding anything that's very reasonable. I found that as of today, at least for about $220-ish, you can start looking at uh, GTX 1063 gig versions, and then anything else in the mid-range is just really, really overpriced. So it all depends on what you want that final cost of your system build to end up being, how much money you're working with, and remember, a graphics card is a really easy thing to swap out. So if a 1050 Ti 2 gig is all you can afford right now, you can get that, start gaming, and then it's a simple thing to swap out another graphics card once uh, the prices come down in the future, or maybe once we get more towards, say, Black Friday and you have a bunch of sales going on. So I went ahead and pulled all of these components out of the retail boxes, and I pulled the relevant stuff that you'll need as far as accessories that are included out of the boxes as well. 
So for the motherboard, I have an IO shield. This is very important. It actually installs in this little spot here at the back of the case. Uh, I also pulled out a serial ATA cable because we'll need to connect that up to our SSD. And then I also pulled out the user guide because it's just uh, important or helpful to have on hand depending on uh, plugging in front panel connectors and that kind of thing. SSDs just still there, just chilling. Uh, I got both of my memory sticks laid out, of course, nothing extra to go along with those. And of course, uh, the CPU I've pulled out. Now the CPU you should be careful with, it is delicate. Um, I keep it in the clamshell until I'm ready, and it's got uh, pins on the bottom, you should be careful not to bend. This will come with a Wraith cooler. Uh, I believe this is a version of the Wraith Stealth. That means we don't need to purchase an aftermarket uh, CPU cooler to keep things cool on the CPU side. It also means that we have some thermal paste that's pre-applied on the bottom there. So we're just gonna be using that so we won't need to worry about thermal paste also. Going to keep that sitting in the box until it's ready to go. Graphics card is out and good to go as well. Power supply is out and good to go as well. This is partially modular, so it's got a couple cables that are uh, attached all the time, and then it's got these modular plugs here. And um, since the graphics card doesn't need extra power to plug into it, it's only it's going to get to all of its power through the PCI Express connection. All we need for the power supply, as far as extra cables, is this modular SATA cable, and that is to provide power to our SSD as well. Now as far as um, the stuff that I'm using to build things, I just have a rubber mat to um, put like the motherboard on when I'm working on it. That's to protect both the motherboard as well as the table from getting scratched up. A couple screwdrivers, just standard Phillips head is uh, usually all you'll need. And then I did do a couple add-on pieces for this build. One was an additional fan. Uh, this case only comes with a single fan, uh, which I believe is set up to exhaust. I added a one in, as an intake in the front as well. So 120 millimeter fan, you can get for as cheap as five bucks or so, but usually 10, 10 to 20 bucks for a decent one. Uh, this one's a fractal venturi. And then I also got just a tiny little splitter uh, so I can take one of the plugs on the motherboard and split it to plug two fans into it because we've only got two fan plugs headers on this motherboard. One is for the CPU, and then it's only got one other chassis fan header right here. Since we have two chassis fans, splitter will let, allow us to plug both of them in. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get your motherboard set up. And I usually like to do this outside of the case, uh, just makes it a little bit easier. Now you've got a socket here that's at the center with a lever that hold, holds things in place. You've also got uh, this existing AM4 mount right here. And we're actually not gonna use this. Uh, the mount that ships with the uh, Ryzen 3 CPU that we got actually doesn't use these top retention brackets. So first, let's remove those really quick. Next, we can go ahead and install our CPU. So we go ahead and pull that out of the clamshell. Now, pay very close attention here because there is a gold triangle on one corner of the CPU. There's also a triangle indentation on one corner of the socket as well. So uh, keep an eye on both of those and you wanna make sure to line those up. Just lift up the little lever arm on the sockets, line up that triangle in the proper corner and just gently set it right on top. It should drop right in once the uh, pins all line up like it did just there. Zero insertion force, so don't need to push down on it at all. It should just drop right in there and then close the lever and it is secured in place. Now we can go ahead and install the heatsink fan on top of it. Choose which way you want your AMD logo to go, uh, facing that way or facing this way. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and we'll do it this way. Uh, and just set it down on top. Uh, try to keep things even, but since you have that thermal paste pre-applied and kind of spread out, it's not gonna be too challenging. Basically just line that up on top and then go ahead and uh, tighten down all, all four screws. Once it's lined up on top though, I'd like to just get each corner started and threaded just to get things sort of attached. Uh, don't tighten one corner down all the way though before you start the others. You wanna kinda do it uh, in a opposite pattern. So give each side a couple twists and that way you won't put too much pressure down on one corner of the CPU. That's something you want to avoid. All right, that's all secured on there. It just uh, went straight through to the back plate at the back of the motherboard. And now we just have this single cable here. It's got a four pin plug on it. Since that's our CPU fan, we just plug it into the four pin CPU fan header. That's right over here. Next up, we'll install our memory, and I purposely chose this motherboard because it has four memory slots. That means that we can install one or even two right now and still have a couple to add more memory in the future if you choose to do so. Now, double check your motherboard manufacturer's manual. That's why I kept that out. And uh, which memory slots you should populate first. Usually there is an order. Uh, I happen to know that with, with Asus, they do every other slot. So we're gonna go with the second and fourth slots right here. And uh, we're just going to take our memory 
Note that there's a, a little notch there right in the center, and that is actually not centered, it's slightly off-center. So we want to make sure that that notch lines up with the notch that's on the actual dim slot itself, which is right about there. Should line up in either side, push down, and you know, you'll notice there's only a latch on one side on this motherboard, that is okay. Uh, some motherboards have latches on both sides, but just apply firm pressure straight down. You should hear a little bit of a snap as it goes down into the socket, and you'll find that that latch uh, cinches up and locks down, and we'll just do the same exact thing with our second stick right over here. So the motherboard should pretty much be good to go, so we can uh, shift our attention over to the case now, and we want to do a couple things to make sure the case is prepped and ready to go. Now one thing that's very important is going to be motherboard standoffs. These are uh, little brass standoff screws. They are conductive and they need to be positioned on the motherboard uh, tray, actually here, 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 and then two more down at the bottom. So there's six total, two, four, and six. If you're using a larger size motherboard or a full size ATX case, you might have up to nine of those that you need to make sure are in the proper place. Typically, uh, the case will have some sort of labeling as to where those go. And you can also double check your motherboard itself as far as where the standoff locations might be. And just uh, so you guys can see them here as well, two there on the top, two here in the middle, and two more down there at the bottom. Beyond that, I've also installed my 120 millimeter intake fan here at the front. Just uh, grab the bottom of the uh, front of the chassis, you can pull that entire panel off and then just screw that in from the front. Uh, and then I also made sure that my cables are kind of tucked away down here at the bottom so I can route stuff up properly. And we're definitely going to want to make use of the accessories that came along with the case and they were just tucked in there in a little baggie. Uh, I have screws to screw in the motherboard standoffs. I also have, well, more standoffs if I happened to have needed more. And then of course the ever important installation of the IO shield, which uh, I'm going to try to do on the fly right now. So IO shields can be quite finicky sometimes, and this is uh, not a high-end one, so beware of sharp edges on it. But you'll notice it kind of lines up here, uh, placing it from the inside, and we'll just kind of want to pop each corner into place, which sometimes takes a bit of pressure. And if it does give you a hard time like this one is, uh, just take the butt end of a screwdriver from the back, apply some pressure, and you should get it to pop into place. Next, let's get the power supply installed, and I'm going to start off actually by uh, connecting that modular cable that I needed for my SATA. And then this power supply actually mounts at the top of the case, some power supplies mount at the bottom, but uh, since there is no uh, exhaust or ventilation at the top, I'm going to point the fan facing down, so it'll be pulling air from uh, inside the case and then uh, pushing it across the power supply and ejecting it out the back, and uh, it should mount up from the back with four screws. I was just about ready to install the motherboard, but I wanted to also drop the SSD in as well. And this case actually doesn't have very good support for two and a half inch drives. It has good support for three and a half inch drives, and it's got a couple five and a quarter inch drive slots for like optical drives in the front, but no straight 2.5 inch drive mount. So I actually just went ahead and got a couple screws, screwed that through the bottom just to mount this sort of uh, here ghetto style. SSDs aren't really that big of a deal actually since there's no moving parts inside. They can just sort of hang loose in a case or you can use velcro to attach them or whatever. You can get creative is what I'm saying but in this case I was able to just screw it through the bottom there. That uh, secured it enough that I'll be able to plug in the power and data connectors right there when I get to that. And now uh, let's go ahead and drop that motherboard in. What, what do you say? Motherboard's right over here. It's pretty safe to uh, hold the motherboard by the heatsink fan once it's, inst it's installed. Just, you know, don't put too much pressure on it. And you'll notice the I.O. on that side of the motherboard right there. I'm just going to sort of angle that into the case downward like so. This might take a little bit of moving around and wiggling. Actually, you know what? I need to do it the other way. I'm going to go this side in first. That way I can kind of slip that down under the corner. And then over here, the I.O. And then we should start seeing the actual ports and whatnot poke out here at the back, provided of course they're not being blocked by a fan cable. Okay, I'll be honest, that was super annoying, but there's all these little contact points in here that are supposed to go in and make contact with some of the plugs 
Sometimes you have to bend them up out of the way or that kind of thing just to get it to all go in. But it has gone in and uh, so our motherboard is aligned in there. The other thing that we're going to keep a close eye on right now is now that the motherboard is installed. Well, it's not all the way installed, but um, we should be able to see our standoffs through our standoff mounting points, as you can see along here. So next step, we'll just uh, screw those in. And remember, as you install motherboard screws, just make them snug. You don't want to over tighten them. If you over tighten them, then when you try to uninstall the motherboard, which maybe you'll do at some point, uh, you might back off the standoff as well. That's always super annoying. So with the motherboard all secured, most of our hardware is actually in the system now, aside from uh, the graphics card, of course. But we need to start actually connecting things up to the motherboard. We have a bunch of cables coming here from the front panel. Get to those in just a second. I went ahead and connected up my fans. I actually took the rear 120 millimeter exhaust fan, kind of tied up the cable here and zip tied it, and plugged that into one of the two leads coming off my fan splitter down here at the bottom. Second one needs to plug into this uh, front fan up here. This one has a much longer cable, fortunately, so I'm actually just gonna kind of tuck that down against the motherboard. It'll go under the graphics card right there, uh, and then it'll just go along the bottom of the case. I might, I might try to, to push it up uh, behind the motherboard a little bit if I can. So yeah, that works, kind of keeps it down and out of the way. And uh, now I think we'll go ahead and start plugging in our uh, actual power cables coming from our power supply over here. Now the basic idea with this is uh, we have two main power connectors that go into the motherboard. One is the 8 pin right there, one is the 24 pin that's right over there. We need of course that SATA power plug for this and that's pretty much it, so uh, that's cool. Any of the excess cables we'll just try to kind of shove up here in this empty five and a quarter bay just to get them out of the way and help give us good airflow. Uh, and I'm gonna try to figure out how, how, how best to, to kind of wrap these down here. Power is connected, so next up is data, at least uh, for this serial ATA drive over there. So uh, bear in mind when you're plugging in SATA drives, whether it's a 2.5 inch SSD like this or a full size 3.5 inch mechanical drive, there's two plugs for each one. Uh, one will provide power and that comes from the power supply and that is the longer cable or longer plug. Most, uh, both plugs are L-shaped, they have sort of a L-shaped size on one end. And then there's a smaller uh, cable which is for data. Uh, which also has an L-shaped plug to it. Just make sure you have those oriented the right way and it should just pop right in there. I did, we do need to plug in the other side of our SATA cable to the SATA plugs on the motherboard. So there's a couple uh, right angle ones right here. Again, L-shaped plug, just to make sure it's going in at the right angle. And it should snap into place and kind of click and latch. And finally, for connections to the case, we have these front panel connectors. Now, the long blue one on the left is USB 3.0. Uh, then there's USB 2.0 right next to it. Notice that these are kind of also differently keyed, so like the USB and then the uh, front panel audio right there have different pinouts. You can reference your motherboard's manual for these uh, as far as what connects where, and especially the front panel connectors, because that is typically the most annoying part of this whole ordeal. Uh, but yeah, hard drive LED, power LED, power and reset switches are all labeled in these and you need to make sure that those connect to the appropriate tiny, tiny little pinout heads uh, on the motherboard itself, which are down there, usually along the bottom edge. And finally, we've got the last piece of the puzzle here, our graphics card. Uh, basically, you got a PCI Express long edge connector down there at the bottom that goes into the long edge connector PCIe slot on the motherboard. Uh, you also have your video outs here at the back, and those, of course, go out the back of the case. Now, uh, like I said, I've already built in this case, so I already removed these two PCIe slot covers. Uh, it is a, d a double slot card, so it needs to remove two of them that line up with this. You might have to remove different ones depending on uh, what you have there and what case you're using. But then of course we've got uh, two screws that we're gonna use to secure this in place. And uh, bear in mind that little latch on the right side will, uh, or it's supposed to pop up and catch on the back of that when it actually drops in properly. So let's see if we can do that.
And there you have it guys. This is pretty much the completed build and I did this sort of quick and dirty for a couple reasons. Like you might notice some of the things that we get nitpicky about at certain times like if you've ever watched our live show that I do on Tuesday evenings. The cable management in here isn't ideal but there's still plenty of airflow coming from the front intake fan down here. It's all pretty open in here. There's nothing conflicting with fans or anything like that. And everything is connected and plugged in and it all uh, it all came together pretty well. GPU down there at the bottom again doesn't need any extra power, but if you did have a, a higher end graphics card that did have a supplemental PCI Express power connectors, you would need to get another one of those modular cables from the power supply and route it down there to plug that in. But other than that, you know, you know all the basics of how to put together a little Ryzen 3 base system here. And uh, this system, well this system as put together is going to cost a little bit more than $525, but using the parts list that I have in the description, you can see how uh, you can put together a really inexpensive gaming PC on this platform. The final steps uh, before of course you move on to the next stage which is uh, installing uh, software and everything is to of course plug in, turn on the power, and then we'll just go ahead and test our, our front power button right there. And there we go. Fans are spinning up and we at least have an initial indication that we've done, done everything properly. So guys that pretty much wraps it up for my how to build a inexpensive Ryzen 3 gaming PC tutorial. Now if you've gotten to this step and you're wondering what to do next, I highly encourage you to check out my first five things to do with a brand new PC build video. I will link that uh, in a card as well as in the description down below. So check that out because that'll take you from like, hey I put it together and the fans are spinning up to like getting Windows installed, uh, even so far as like setting up Steam and transferring games and all that kind of stuff as well. I'm excited to test this system out. It will be following up with some benchmarks and some performance on it. I should also get into the BIOS and uh, adjust the fan speeds because right now they're running at full speed and it's a little loud, but uh, at least it's moving a lot of air. That is all I have time for today though, so hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave comments in the comment section if you have any questions. And a huge thanks to any of you guys who are down there in the comment section answering the questions of people who have asked them who I haven't had a chance to get to because there's way more questions than I usually have time to respond to. Thanks again for watching guys and we'll see you next time.